Welcome to Reader Syndicate 3.0, the next evolution of the look into counterculture that is canon. My name is Matthew, owner of Riot Seeds, and this started as a one-man mission for strain history and breeding science. Over time, it's evolved into something bigger, better, and more of a team effort. We will be joined by members of the Can Illuminati and other friends throughout the seasons to hear their takes on grow techniques, breeding science, strain history, and more. Our mission is to combat the narrative that corporate cannabis and seed posers are obfuscating for their own financial benefit. Welcome to the underground. We are the Syndicate. Hey everyone, welcome to Breeder Syndicate. So this kind of rolls in as a hot start with me and Damien Abraham. Um, for those of you who don't know, Damien is from the band. Um, God, I guess it's the first minute, so I'll probably get in trouble for cussing, but it's fucked up. <laughs> the band fucked up, but he's also really well known um, for his work with Vice Magazine early on, a lot of the documentaries. He's he, he's just a legend in the punk rock scene, and uh, especially for the historical part of the punk rock scene. But he's also a major cannabis advocate, and... Uh, yeah, we've been on each other's shows now, and and I really wanted to do one with him here. Um, it's it's not all punk rock based, which I thought it would probably be more punk rock based. And it, you know, I, I understand that a lot of people that are in Canada aren't necessarily as interested in punk rock, but this one applies, I think, to everyone, and uh, I think everyone's really going to dig it. Absolutely loved it. It was a pleasure recording with him. And with that, we kind of just slide right into the conversation because that's how we roll. So yeah. Thank you so much. I'm drinking coffee. I never drink coffee. <laughs> is that is that to edge or off edge? I guess so. I don't know. Cannabis is my coffee. I feel like I, I definitely, uh, if I didn't smoke cannabis after the birth of my children, I don't know what it would have got me through those sleepless nights. I think that was the, uh, that finally broke my edge, to be honest. Really? Was that I, it? Yeah, it was that. It was having kids, being on anxiety pill, anti-anxiety pills, I should yeah. say. Um, having to cycle on and off them to get yes. to be able to write lyrics, which yeah. is a, a side a effect. Trip. They don't they don't bring that side effect up in the uh, preamble. Of no, the they book. don't. Yeah, it depletes creativity. Yeah, like I just I don't know what it is, but I guess it just kind of like because it you know mutes the highs and lows. Yeah. Um, it really I guess it's hard to get to those places creatively, at yeah. least for for me. And I'm I'm sure there's lots of people that find it completely pain-free to write on anti-anxiety pills and are, are very creative on it but that's not me you know i, I definitely yeah. would have to cycle on and off them and cycled off them and and arrived in um we were in in holland uh we were in amsterdam or the netherlands now right netherlands right yeah yeah uh, netherlands sorry and uh and uh just was like can i hit that joint that you guys got to my band and they were all kind of shocked uh they said i had broke edge before but i had not it was yeah. it was that time and uh to get off the joint and immediately kind of was like oh this is what i was missing and i experimented with cannabis in the the dirty 90s a little yeah. bit when you know there were like four i guess i, I don't even know different types is what we knew man we didn't even know them as strains or yeah so right. not as cultivars right like it was just yeah, like yeah. this guy's got one that's like uh it it, it, it must be laced with coke because it's so <laughs> strong and it was just like really crystally i guess like looking back yeah. on it now or there's one guy it was like oh this guy's stuff is, is definitely laced because it's just like so purple and yeah you know so I'd experimented with cannabis. I think I've been stoned maybe once or twice previously. Like I tried acid and that was more my speed before I went straight edge. Oh, really? Yeah. I really yeah. liked psychedelics and yeah. uh, cannabis. You know, like it was just so hit or miss what you were getting back then. And I'm like, I didn't know how to inhale. I was yeah. like, I think I'm getting it. I think I'm getting <laughs> it. My, the first time I built it in style. Yeah. Well, first, first time I had my first cigarette, my first beer, my first joint, my first hit of acid was all one day. That's a yeah. lot. Yeah. How old were you? 14. Yeah, that's a good age for it. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a 15 year old upstairs right now. So I got to be very careful <laughs> if he's listening in on this conversation. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, we can get into that parenting yeah, should. with cannabis should. later on. But uh, yeah, so I tried it and came back and told my doctor, you know, fast forward to when I'm trying it yeah. as, a, as a 30 year old. 
and was like, I found something that works. It, it took away my anxiety and there's no side effects on it. Like, it's great. You're not going to believe it. It's, it's weed. And <laughs> she's like, no way. That Your is doctor wasn't too receptive. Not at all. And this is like, so. this is pre like Canada legalization came, it, you know, obviously in a lot of different phases, but I think like sure. the, the lead up to it, there was sort of this like medical rush that kind of started where all doctors got on board. A lot of doctors realized they get rich yeah. running these cannabis clinics and my doctor eventually kind of came around just before that, but it was only when I started losing weight. Like I was a hundred or so pounds heavier than I am now. Yeah. Back then, uh, I would drink a lot of soda. That was my, yeah, my, that'll do it, my, dude. Yeah. I was drinking like six liters a day. Jesus. Uh, most of the days on tour. Well, see, you, you wake up, you like you have a large, like I would have large, <laughs> you, I would have two large sodas at breakfast because yeah. I get a refill. Yeah. Uh, then at lunch and then backstage, there's always free soda. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. And then after the show, we get some pops. So yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty severe, but yeah, try cannabis, got off all that stuff and went off the anti-anxiety pills against my doctor's orders. And, uh, once I started losing the weight, she's like, okay, I'll sign your, your forms for you to get into a compassion club. And th at that point in Toronto, That's there so were. Bad two compassion clubs one mm. one was pretty strict and you know like you had to be signed in by a doctor the other one if, if you knew the right people i think you get around the doctor thing but this was definitely one of the ones that you needed your doctor to really sign off for you at and by that point i'd already made some connections so i had other hookups to get it from but the compassion club was great because it kind of gave me exposure to like a whole new side of cannabis back then like it it, it it's so recent time-wise but it was just such a different world right like pre-medical yeah. pre-legalization it was like a secret society back then so what what initially pushed you like from trying cannabis and lsd and shit like that to going straight edge like was it just the punk scene the type of music you were listening to people no i went i went kind of straight edge before all that i just kind of hated everyone around me at school yeah and uh, not wanting to be like the people like around. Me. Yeah, like I think that's also what prevented me from admitting that I liked pro wrestling for so long. And yeah. I would kind of watch it in secret because I hated the kids at my school that were into wrestling. And Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, and it just felt like, and I also it was like, my parents both smoked weed the whole time. Um, off and on with my dad. He doesn't really smoke weed now. Yeah at all but my my mom secretly smoked weed and she was like i tried it once i didn't like it and never tried it again <laughs> yeah uh so i think i found like a real rebellion like my dad was like really freaked out by straight edge and, oh really yeah like, yeah i could see that being a little rebellious was, too like from the yeah. future kind of yeah like i think it was the dogma of it i think it was the fact that like why are you doing this like normally when someone decides to be sober it's because they've got a problem or because yeah. their yeah. religion tells them or you know to say like i'm just doing it because i want to do it and then to be kind of aggressive with it like like xing up before i went to his wedding and stuff yeah. it's weird <laughs> like things that like you know just obviously are attention getting you realize as you're older but at the time it, it just is like this is important and it yeah. really made sense to me and it did really make sense to me i'm I'm glad i was straight edge when i was straight edge and then i came back to cannabis just at the right time like swing plate rigs had just kind of hit and extracts and concentrates were just kind of coming out and obviously the medical wave was just about to really start hitting in america in, sorry in canada it already kind of started i guess in california yeah um we even though i recently read that we actually had medical cannabis in canada first but it was just such a shitty program uh that that's probably it, right too yeah yeah just stunted it for a long time up here but that's why i guess we had such great bud out in bc is because everyone had these really um great doctors that were signing them then them into this medical yeah. program that was really hard to get signed into back then and um yeah, like so, I, I'm I'm glad I was certainly I wouldn't take back being straight edge at all, but I I'm glad I got into weed when I did because it was just in time to kind of see 
the roaring 20s of cannabis just before uh you know legalization changed everything not necessarily in the most positive ways all the time but changed everything nonetheless so even being like straight edge or identifying with straight edge you were still in a band with people that like used pot right yeah. like yeah you, you so it wasn't like super dogmatic like no minor threat era like no <laughs> No, you, never you would have a really hard time, I think, in Toronto being dogmatic about that stuff, not just in the punk scene, but I just think in, in general, right? Like, it's just, yeah. it's a big city. And I think that kind of like straight edge militancy probably works when you're in a very small town or a very small, yeah, for sure. stuff, you know, where you can kind of control yeah. things a lot more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it was never, yeah, I always had friends that smoked and drank and I kind of loved being around people that smoked and drank and never really had a problem with it in sort of outside myself kind of way. And I think now in, in retrospect, I probably wouldn't have had a problem with it myself if, if I had been doing it back then, but I just, you know, it, it was a, a, a good time for me not to be doing it, looking at some of my friends and some of the sort of paths they went down. Sure. You yeah. know, and it, it was, pre the cocaine revival and pre all that kind of stuff but yeah still there was still obviously lots of wildness being had in the late 90s was there a big like a, a heroin surge up there in canada for the punk scene it, there was it's kind of been here the whole way through we actually had there's a band from up here called the bunch of fucking goofs the bfg yeah, you told me about them yeah yeah they're like they're our band they're like a the legendary band i think every scene kind of has the band that never got out of the scene necessarily but if you ask anyone that's around that scene yeah. like who the most important band is the bfgs came out i guess 84 well, they've, they've 83 and really into the late late 90s early 2000s they were still pretty strong when yeah. they were going and so they policed the scene they had fort goof was was their house and you talk to bands that came through Toronto they all have stories about going to Fort Goof and Jerry A tells a story about having like some crazy open wound from the stage on his leg and some dog licking it and then being like no 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 don't worry dog's mouths are disinfectants it'll be fine <laughs> and Jerry's like really you think and they're like yeah yeah yeah, yeah good fine. enough yeah, good got enough. a crazy infection the next day <laughs> uh, there's like but they because they police the scene they're big stances were no hard drugs so no yeah. crack no heroin and uh no nazis yeah so because of that there there obviously were these things in and around toronto but you just didn't really see it around the punk scene yeah major and then with the arrival i guess of oxy and then fentanyl that changed everything and you really oh, did start sure. deaths start happening in toronto and 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 these had happened before, but I think um, for our scene, it was kind of new when, when fentanyl really started hitting or oxys before that, I guess. Yeah, that really did make it hardcore available for everyone. I always just yeah. wondered, like, with um, with heroin, how it worked, like, up in Canada, like, uh, the actual trade of it and how it moved its way up. If it made, like, like the Mexican black tar made it up that way and fucked the whole scenes up and and killed it off or what because it definitely happens here you know it, it's interesting there is definitely like a pipeline that's established between out west out west is a is heroin obviously like yeah, anyone yeah. That's been to vancouver will tell you right that opioids have uh really wreaked havoc on the population in that city and uh you really you see that begin in the punk scene like yeah. people have on turn it a punk outed certain people as being the the conduits for heroin arriving in the punk scene oh, and brutal. there is a <laughs> there was a pipeline kind of established there was this guy for the more for for weed but there was this mm -hmm. guy uh rosie who's the the hash king of okay of Toronto. he was bringing in tons and tons of hash and he got busted and he was put on trial with neil young's brother mm -hmm. and norman mailer testified in their de defense the day after he like won an or presented an oscar oh that's wild and they got like eight years for that but yeah rosie's story's wild like he but he went out west and met the guys out west which was a lot of dudes in bike clubs uh, yeah. a lot of guys that come up from the states during the vietnam war and kind of afterwards and there have been a lot of seeds and and genetics that have come up through canada at that point and rosie kind of brought the hash across and they had the flower and that was sort of the 
exchange for a while. But there was stuff coming up from like Jamaican Cess. Toronto yeah. has a, a, a ra rather large Jamaican population or people from Jamaica. Um, and, and around that time, there's a lot of Cess around here. But people talk about how great the hash was in Toronto. And then Rosie got busted the second time. He gets out of prison that first time that he got busted with Neil Young's brother and gets interviewed by some reporter from Rolling Stone. And the reporter's like, let's get the band back together. Do they like, start, <laughs> start smuggling hash and I'll be in America. You'll be in Canada. It'll be amazing. So tempting. So they do it. Yeah. They, they were bringing in tons and tons of hash and eventually, you know, the, the, the law caught on to it. And, and there's this whole wild story about tons of hash being brought into New York and, them letting the sale go the cia or something letting the sale go through like deep i'm probably messing up all the details of it but anyway he gets busted again and this time when rosie's on trial he gets neil young to testify in his defense and neil <laughs> young <laughs> young though. yeah because he's famous or like fucking yeah, and on, he was bro. busted with his brother before right so yeah that yeah. familial connection and neil looks around the room and he's like i smoke weed every day and i earn more money than all you put together <laughs> <laughs> and they gave Rosie like 28 years. That time. Oh my God. <laughs> so, so Neil Young didn't like uh, pulling favors for him. No, no, I don't. Speaking. That's the that's celebrity name drop you don't want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just sounds like a circus. Like, fuck it, bring in Neil Young just because we can. But Rosie was definitely like the, um, the link for a lot of that stuff going out west. And I think a lot of that sort of connection between out west and out, out here going back to, you know, the 70s. Yeah. So one thing I do want to talk about like early on is the new video, obviously, mm -hmm. because there, there, there really isn't to me like anything covering cannabis history in any meaningful way uh, in music like that currently, especially not in punk rock or hardcore or any of it. You know what I mean? Like it, it's not, it's not a normal thing to see. So I, I'm stoked on it. And um, it's something I wanted to bring up and, and, and make sure everybody gets to see. I don't oh. even think we've mentioned your fucking band yet. No, I kind of so, just rolled in hot. Am, yeah, am, am no, I allowed no, to great. consume or no? Yeah, 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 you're fine. I'll, I can duck off if you don't yeah, want to. Yeah, no, you're, you're fine, dude. Okay. Yeah, yeah um, they only get mad about, like, showing plants for some reason. <laughs> hey, don't worry. Yeah. I wish I had some to show off, but I, I know, right? <laughs> I only have a post-product. Um, uh, yeah, the video was, was a man. Thank you again publicly for your help on this because um, it's something I wanted to – I think there's just – I'm, I'm fascinated by history of stuff. And, yeah. and, and, and once I kind of get into something, I want to really kind of get into it and, and figure it out. And I think with cannabis, there's just so many false paths that you can wind up going down. And there's just so much false information that's out there that digging in and talking to people that, that know about the plant that have experience with the plant and, and you know, so like not to put you over on your own shit, but like someone like yourself who's actually like <laughs> putting the work. That. Yeah, like that's, it's like kind of invaluable because it's not really something you can pick up a book. You know, there's just so many yeah, books that you hard. can't pick up that are full of disinformation and misinformation, and and to kind of like put all those pieces together, it's uh, you really do rely on people that have been kind of putting this puzzle together before you to kind of help you figure it out. And yeah, like it, it's just trying to pay tribute to this amazing plant that I've had a relationship with now for like i guess 15 years yeah really intensely but has been around for millennia and has been involved in the human experience for millennia and it's just so misunderstood and even when it's not being vilified i think it's being misunderstood like every time i buy cannabis i get asked indica or sativa and yeah right yeah i, I guess it's an icebreaker <laughs> it's not all it is anymore yeah yeah but like the idea that this plant knows, although this plant, like as it's growing, is okay. I got to make sure I present this trait of myself that makes this person want to watch Netflix and eat ice cream. <laughs> there's, like, there's nothing in nature that would make a plant want to do that to you. So, why is this person thinking that that's going to have or trying to tell me that it's going to have that kind of effect on me? Yeah. And I just, it feels like there's a lot of silliness around cannabis and not that our video is not silly in its own way but i wanted like in amongst the silliness to have some like actual real information yeah about, about it 
Yeah. So what was like the inspiration for doing it right now versus even 10 years ago? Fucked up would let me. I it's like the band finally all kind of just <laughs> signed off on it. Yeah, the band signed off on it. I guess we have on our last record, uh, we have a song uh, called Lords of Kensington, which is about this neighborhood in Toronto called Kensington Market, mm -hmm. which at one point was a uh, a market kind of area for recently arrived people from Eastern Europe and then people recently arrived from China and Hong Kong and Taiwan. And then just sort of in the 90s, it became a place with lots of thrift stores and still lots of food markets and things like that. But it was a, a cool neighborhood. And we had a, a bunch of neat little venues in there, like um, Who's Emma or the Anarchist Free Space, where you could kind of just put on shows in the basement and That's buy right. records or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so the song is kind of reflecting on that neighborhood and the changes in that neighborhood and the fact that there was this park in this neighborhood um, that's still there and that park was where kids would always go and just smoke weed and there was a lot of people selling weed and then cops got wise to it and would go down and fake sell weed to kids and yeah, trap course. kids and and fuck up kids lives and then in one of the kind of the grossest displays of post-legalization uh cannabis in canada this the former police chief of toronto julian fantino who indirectly probably directly too during his time as a cop is responsible for like thousands of lives being fucked up by cannabis laws uh putting out like an editorial about how he had changed his mind about cannabis finally go figure when there's money on the table right the cop changed yeah. his mind about weed and, <laughs> and opened a weed store in kensington market and so i wrote a song on the last record about that and um on this record it's kind of like a, a fantasy about a kid who had been arrested by a cop going down and watching the cops weed store grow to business. And, yeah. uh, and so I, with this song being so directly about cannabis and me unrelentingly uh, kind of asking fucked up for years, can we do something about weed? They finally were like, all right, do your fucking weed video. <laughs> <laughs> Jonah from fucked up really kind of carried it for me because That's as awesome. you know, from dealing with me, man, I'm a little disorganized. Yeah, yeah, he's a nice dude. I, I enjoyed meeting him. Best. He's very talented. Yeah, he's the uh, like uh, he could do anyone's job in fucked up. Like fucked up could function completely well just with him as a one. What other bands is he in? Career suicide. Yeah. Um, uh, he did a band called Mad Men for a while. That was an amazing kind of hardcore band. Uh, he played drums as well. Oh, man, I know I'm forgetting something he played drums in. And now he does Jade Hairpins. Yeah. Uh, he also does a band called Boss with a bunch of guys, like guys from Ricks and guys from uh, Chubby and the Gang. It's kind of like an international pub rock kind That's of band. That's so awesome. Uh, and then he produces a lot of records. He produced that last Lex on Fire record that was a big record up here. And he's, yeah, he's super talented. He's definitely the best member of our band by far. Has he been in it since the the beginning? Is it like all the members always been in the band or? Yeah, I was the last one to join. They did really four, four shows with uh, Josh as the singer, the, the guy who plays guitar in the band now. And then he went to train hop uh, down in the US. So punk rock. It was pretty September 11th when you could still kind of train hop. Yeah, across the yeah. border. And uh, so he trained hop down there in, in the States and they had three shows lined up and they were like, do you want to sing these three shows? And I sang them and we had fun. And so when Josh came back, uh, Mike from Fucked Up was like, you're just going to learn guitar and Damien's going to be the singer now. And that's what it's kind of been <laughs> weirdly ever since. I don't think any of us, I think every stage of Fucked Up has felt like the last. So yeah, I don't think anyone in the band thought it would be like this uh, at all. How many years has the band been running? 24 that's so long dude for, for people to get along enough to be in a van and oh we don't get along oh we don't get along at all <laughs> <laughs> don't I mean, that's just how it goes <laughs> yeah I, it's yeah. it's funny when we were like i remember one of the first big festivals we played was tea in the park in in edinburgh and uh raging with the machine showed up and each one was in a separate sprinter van <laughs> and it's like Oh my god, like how bad does it have to be that you can't even sit in the same van as the rest of the people in your band? 
And not that we have the means for it in Fucked Up, but if we yeah. did have the means, I'm sure we would all be in separate Sprinter vans now. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee it. Yeah, that's so funny, dude. <laughs> so let's let's talk about um, your Vice era. Yeah. And things that you did with Vice, uh, specifically for cannabis, also with the wrestlers, because that's mm-hmm. like uh, something I was fascinated with. It was, um, yeah, it was wild. Like, How did that even come to be? Oh, man. <laughs> uh you want like you want the whole vice yeah. saga from beginning yeah to yeah oh, why man. not why all not right. all right maybe let me do let me do my uh shit my dab first and then, yeah, I'll, go ahead. then I'll get really into it because this is like uh like it's interesting like the history of vice when you when you really start breaking it my friend was like whatever you do don't show your smoking setup on the podcast because it's like the bummiest smoking setup anyone's <laughs> ever seen and like <laughs> You know, cannabis is such a heady world where everyone's like, oh, you got to have heady shit. Like, I, I like basically am one step above smoking out of a tin can. Yeah, you don't have you don't have a bunch of trap trophies still. No, no. Yeah. I'm, uh, okay. I've had some glass pieces, but they have all been broken. I got yeah. my one. I'll show my one rig in a second. That's my like my one cool piece. But it's got a good story attached to vice. Yeah, that's right. Huh? All right. Do you edit or am I and this is all live? Oh no, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. I can edit. Okay, yeah, I just didn't. I'm sorry about that. I should have no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it at all. Okay. Do you use a thermometer when you're dabbing? Uh no, I always just ended up using a puffco because I'm oh, way okay. too lazy to my friend to do all got that. my friend gave me his old uh thermometer and it changed yeah. the way I dab. It just completely yeah once you know you're supposed to be a certain temperature and not just nail that bitch hot you know? no exactly <laughs> like when i i realized that every dab i had taken before had been way too hot yeah <coughs> all right now i'm good all right. <laughs> so the uh i played in a band when i was in grade nine and 10 called you're in trouble. Okay. And the first show, the second show we ever played afterwards, we went to a restaurant that was open super late and walking in, they would have all like the free newspapers and things like that. And Toronto being a big city, we had a lot of free weeklies and, and other papers back then. And I saw this one with a Frank Kozik picture on the cover of a dog with a machine gun. I love Kozik. Rest Same. In and peace. and yeah. I was a huge, uh, absolutely rest in peace. Someone who I think, yeah, we could do a whole podcast. You know, oh, just talking about for Kozik. sure. Um, so I was like, oh, my God, Frank Kozik. And they had an article about propaganda. I remember in that issue and something else. And it was called Voice back then. Mm-hmm. And I picked it up and I'm like, this is really cool. And then it became Vice really shortly thereafter. And it was still like a newsprint thing that you'd pick yeah. up and had the do's and don'ts. And it was talking about garage rock in Montreal. And they... They kept talking about this record label they were starting back then called SSG Records, and they were going to be putting out all these records. And it just seemed, right even then, super cool. Like, it was talking about punk. It was talking about rap music. It had cool comics in it. It was, and it was really well written. And there was just something about it. And so I just kind of, like, I picked it up every month after that. Like, it was just something you you grabbed you like you go to the record store and they're like oh the new issue of vice is here i i've got one that's got like a len flexi in it with bismarck the bismarck key song that they did with len that came yeah. in one issue of vice like it was just part of like my youth and so we start fucked up like years later and uh we get weirdly out of the blue one day we get an email from a guy named andy capper who was the editor of vice Mm-hmm. uk at the time and he's like um a friend of mine told me about your band uh, i think you guys I, I like your band and he's like i want to do something with you guys and so mike from fucked up was like you should put out a, a seven inch why don't you put out a seven inch on vice records and uh he did but didn't clear it with the rest of vice so it's kind of a bootleg on That's vice awesome. records That's so awesome. uh and then at the same time Artie philly who played in a bunch of great hardcore bands over the years, uh, was who was a writer for Vice. Like that was the thing about Vice, like 
right from the get-go there was tons of punk and hardcore people writing yeah. for it or involved in it and you you kind of always knew people that knew people that were in it or this guy from this band's now writing for them or the guy from the space shits does these reviews or you know like all stuff like that so yeah the arty philly who was writing for them at the time and played in all these hardcore bands hit us in career suicide up and was like can i interview you guys for vice and we both sent our you know answers back to the questions and then he's like, can you guys send some photos? And Martin from Career Suicide never sent photos, but I had some photos that a friend of mine had taken uh, of me bleeding from the head. Yeah, dude. At, at dude, a show. Legendary photos out there. Well, that was the video. thing. You know, like, it, it, that was the... Vice went with that photo, and that was, I think, what made the band. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> that, that photo in Vice magazine. Uh, and then from there, they wanted to sign us, and we didn't sign we ended up signing a matador and there was a lot of drama and it was not great for a couple of years it was, it was so bizarre because it was like something that i had grown up with like it would be like if uh all of a sudden spider-man had beef with you or marvel yeah. comics had beef with you yeah right where yeah. i'm like this is so fucking weird and by this point gavin was long out of the picture it was more with the other people that were left there and it was it was weird. And then they came vice Canada was kind of it, part of the company, but like the kinder, gentler version of vice, like the, the Canadian were, version. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is weird because vice uh, is ultimately started by a bunch of assholes. Yeah. From Canada. But, <laughs> but still the vice office in Toronto was definitely like the Canadian version of vice. Like everyone was a lot friendlier and a lot kinder. And I think if you look at the content that they put out, a lot of it was like a, a lot of it had a lot more heart than a lot yeah. of the U S stuff that was coming around at the same time. But at that time it was still just like a fledgling operation up here in the Toronto office. Like they had just started opening these satellite offices and the Toronto office was pretty new and they came to me and they were like, we want to do uh, a, a thing about Budweiser, a, a thing about bands where you go around and interview bands and it's going to be sponsored by Budweiser beer. And I had, briefly been a vj on much music which is the canadian mtv okay. and just spent the last two years interviewing terrible bands about music <laughs> and was like i don't drink so being sponsored by budweiser was weird to me yeah i bet and uh i i also just don't want to interview bands and they're like well we're looking on to do a medical cannabis documentary too and i'm like perfect i yeah. just got medical weed and we uh, went out to BC and shot the Canadian cannabis documentary, the very first one. And it did really well for Vice Canada on YouTube. That was when Vice YouTube channel was still really popping or just starting to really pop. And so we ended up doing another four more of these documentaries. And uh, it was unbelievable. The experiences were really great. I met some great friends that I'm still super tight with today and friends for life making these documentaries and really got to kind of see like the real side of cannabis out yeah. in BC where and I'm sure it's still huge the stuff but that felt like kind of the crest like it felt like the roaring 20s like there was just 200 plus dispensaries in downtown Vancouver there was like five times more dispensaries than Tim Hortons. I think we've said in one of the documentaries, some, some crazy number of, of these dispensaries and every one of these dispensaries had a lounge upstairs with mm -hmm. where people would just go and do dabs and hang out. All of them were packed. All of them looked like they were turning a profit. Like it really did feel like shit. This is what it should be like. Yeah. And it's weird how post legalization that hasn't come back in any way. And they're, there is obviously tons of money being made by some people in the cannabis industry, but it seems to be like a race to the bottom. And that wasn't it, yeah. necessarily the case back then. Yeah. Um, but, but I'm glad I got to see it. Like I, and I, and I, and I really did realize it at the time. Like I remember the day legalization happened, sitting there with a bunch of friends, having to sesh being like, I think this is it. I think we saw the best shit that happened in weed. Cause they'd already, the cops had already raided all the dispensaries by that point and you could already tell that there was a, a change coming that yeah. 
was, you know, I, I don't know. I thought it was going to be as severe as it was, but, uh, and vice by that point, it already kind of transitioned into making the wrestling content by the time yeah. legalization hit, but they would already like, we had so much goodwill with people on the traditional, the traditional side of the market or the, the legacy market, I should say. Yeah. Uh, that they just kind of eroded immediately. They made a deal with a uh, canopy to do some branded content and, Everyone was bummed out naturally. I remember that watching yeah. the first piece of content they made, and it was not, it was like an ad, it wasn't a documentary. Of course. And then it cuts to the end. And because they weren't allowed to show people consuming in advertorial content, that so you can see that she's clearly rolling up like a cigarette that they cut away from before she like puts it in her mouth to kind of be like, Well, legal weed's <laughs> awesome. And yeah, it was great though. There was a bunch of times they tried to get rid of me and bring in a younger person because that's what Vice was ultimately, you know, running on the blood of the youth. Yeah. And they'd bring in these younger reporters and they might be better reporters than me, but by God, did they not have the tolerance? And so I, one by one, they would all just <laughs> fall as they'd have to go to these sessions with glass blowers or growers or genetics people or just like, you know, people that can smoke. Yeah. And, they would be under the table, passed out, taking Ubers <laughs> home, and they'd have to call me Grandpa. <laughs> what the deal, Grandpa? Bring it back. Yeah, that was my one natural ability that kept me employed at Vice for so long was my tolerance. Actually, no, I forgot. There was one, another big thing that happened was um, Vice had their like twentieth anniversary party, mm -hmm. and uh, was it twentieth? I guess it was twentieth, and they flew. They were like, hey, uh, they, Saroosh from Vice hit me up. He's like, do you want to come to New York and play at our 20th party? And this is before I started making documentaries for him or any of that stuff. This is like the beginning of the kind of thaw and the, the Cold War. Yeah. And uh, I was like, sure, sure. And he's like, okay, you're going to be doing a thing with Nick from the IES, and we want you to do a couple punk songs. And just come down here. We'll figure it out. So I flew down to New York, talked to Nick, and Nick's like, dude, I'm overwhelmed. They got me doing like 50 songs. Can you just figure out? doing like the hardcore set with you know a band yourself and i'm like sure so they put together a band with ben from dillinger escape plan um uh uh what's his name on drums soft circle is his instagram i'm flanking on his name right now but on drums and then Stephen mcdonald from red cross on bass that's so cool it was yeah. awesome and yeah, we did dude. we did a bunch of hardcore songs at this vice party and it was it was it was wild it was the day Little Wayne had left cash money mm -hmm. and Little Wayne was performing there. And so there's all this crazy security. They're like, is baby going to show up? Is shit going to go off? Oh, fucking God. <laughs> Nicki Minaj was supposed to play. She didn't show. Well, I that's finished. A shame. Yeah, we start doing, we do this hardcore set and then I finish and then I look over and there's Spike Jones on bass or keyboards and Jonah Hill covering like Marvin's room. On, on the microphone like it sounds stage, like a bad acid trip but kind of nice so nuts. <laughs> it was so wild uh it was and but after that they gave me a vice ring and i got it here uh, and this was like have you seen that seinfeld episode where kramer gets the tony somehow yeah 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 that's what this ring was like like i all of a sudden had this ring and it was like i was in the masons like I never had to sign in for security at Vice Canada. I think it's because no one really understood what the ring was in Canada. Yeah. It was like the satellite office. So they thought it just meant maybe executive or something. Yeah, you're locked in. Oh, it was crazy. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the amount of shit that they were just like, he's got a ring. So I never had to sign in at security. That's so, so like, funny. So, so many weird things happen. But just because, you know, I Kramered this Tony ring. <laughs> Like when you get pulled over by cops in the U.S., do you just put your hand up with the ring? And they say, no ticket. <laughs> Not anymore. Now they cut your finger off. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah but at one point, Gavin. Well, actually, when we, yeah, when we first <laughs> we did that very first uh, cannabis documentary, they gave me so I had so much weed. Like I, I, I'm leaving the hotel room and I'm like, literally just like eating hash, just like just like chewing raw hash, like <laughs> chewing edibles. So I show up at the airport, and it must have been like 
like pouring out of my pores. Like I must have been sweating Phoenix tears. Oh, I'm sure. And get to the border the first because you have to pre-clear customs at Vancouver and Toronto Airport before you go to the states and immigration. Mm -hmm. So I get to immigration. The guy's like takes a whiff of me and he's like, "Go to go to secondary inspection." So I go into <laughs> secondary inspection. The guy gets my bag and he's like, uh, "Are you bringing weed with you?" And I'm like, no. He's like, dude, you smell like a marijuana grow. <laughs> what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm going to go shoot a music video with my band and play a show in San Francisco. And I was just making a documentary here in Vancouver. Uh, he's like, what, what's the documentary about? I'm like, it's, it's a documentary for Vice about weed. And he's like, Vice? I'm like, yeah. He's like, will it be on the YouTube channel? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I think so. That's the plan. He's like, oh my God, man, that's awesome. And he's like, that's crazy. Zips up my bag, passes it back to me, just escorts me right out. He's like, hey, man, I look forward to seeing that documentary. That's so cool. I love Vice. He's like, you got the ring? Yeah. <laughs> Pre ring. No, oh, I did have my ring. I did have my ring. I, should, I, I don't know if I had it on me, though. It was just very bizarre. Like the power that thing had for a hot moment, it's. It's wild. And I guess we're seeing it now with Drake too, like how quickly culture can change. But yeah, when we started making that wrestling TV show till the end, like at the beginning, vice was a sacred word. You could, you know, you just utter vice and people are willing to help you out in any way they could. Sure. To when we were finished, where it was like, oh, I fucking hate vice, or I used to watch vice. And it's like, yeah, eight months. <laughs> <laughs> so, so was the wrestling show as big as the weed show? Like what, as far as it, views and shit? It's kind of hard to say. Like I still don't even really know. Like the way it went down. So Vice Canada had this huge $500 million deal from Rogers, which is the big cable provider here. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, Rogers just wrote off the investment and said, you can just keep, keep the money that we've paid you so far and keep all your content we don't want it which i really think was the beginning of the dominoes falling for vice yeah in terms of business deals beginning to go south and everything kind of beginning to change so we were part of that rogers deal like we were one of the last shows they greenlit under that rogers deal where they had money to kind of spend yeah. on these kind of tv shows so we, we had a decent budget I didn't see a lot of that decent budget. No one <laughs> making right. that show saw a decent budget, but we got to spend a lot of money making that show. Like it's yeah, crazy bad. looking back on it. And and that's why we were able to travel to all those places that we were able to travel and, and do all these those sorts of things was because this Rogers deal, which then evaporated in the process of making that show, which left our show kind of in limbo. Um, yeah. Vice had changed directions. Vice also never really believed in, in wrestling, which is interesting now with the success they've had with dark side of the ring yeah oh right yeah yeah that kind of and they were in production just after we went into production and that also started in canada their production too uh but someone advice like an executive straight up told me like no one cares about wrestling i'm like there's millions of people watching it every week clearly it there's one of their biggest there. shows yeah and then dark side of the ring became their biggest show that yeah. was days of samaro maddie matheson and uh and that I think are their big success stories of, of kind of the vice TV experiment. Where did the therapist show come in there? Oh, that was when we were making the wrestling show. And that came about because Andy Capper was like, Hey, I'm doing this show where you just come in and talk to this therapist guy. And I'm like, okay, well, how bad could that be? I'm on tour. And he's like, yeah, we'll pay you like 500 bucks for the two hours. I'm like, can I smoke weed? He's like, sure. <laughs> uh, which I don't think is deal. And I don't think you're allowed to give therapy to someone who's uh, not that I would ever not be yeah. high on weed, but like I think <laughs> on, on an ethics level, the fact that this therapist knew that might be a weird conflict, but it was very fucking weird. And it is so intense. And that was an intense show, even oh watching it. God. It's super and intense. The, my mom made me cut out a lot of stuff, I got an early cut of it. And I sent it to my mom and she's like, can you cut out all this shit about your stepfather? And so they really dialed that side of it back, but they got me to say shit on the record that I never, <laughs> never <laughs> want to talk dude. about. And, yeah. and you're there. And I remember the day it aired, I was in the Congo 
filming in, in Kinshasa, filming the episode of The Wrestlers in the in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and sitting in the hotel room, the internet's I can't stream it, but I know it's airing, and just being like having the most intense day in Kinshasa filming where it, every day filming that episode was was pretty intense but I got it. sitting in that room and just being like fuck <laughs> I have this goddamn therapy show airing was tonight. that a panic attack in itself oh there's so many panic attacks every day of that <laughs> experience is a panic attack like uh it was the best year of my life making that show in a lot mm-hmm. of ways like professional year of my life sure because every day was interesting every day was was cool but the amount of travel was very intense we were gone i was gone for two weeks every two weeks yeah and then sometimes it'd be like a month in japan sometimes it was like yeah it's a month in japan bro it was awesome no weed but oh yeah that's right i had a couple opportunities to smoke but i'm like i don't think i'd enjoy it what kind of mids they got in Japan back then? You can get, well, obviously, I'm talking to a guy when, for most people, you can get Cali quality weed there. Like, you know, obviously, so shop, shop level. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say for the rest of the world, like top yeah, yeah. tier weed. But it was at the time I was told $80 a gram, $90 a gram. Fuck. Yeah. That's why Thailand, uh, Thailand legalization looks so attractive to tourists because people are coming from, russia and japan where to pay for that california stuff you're, you're paying you know 90 dollars a gram 80 dollars a gram so to pay 40 dollars a gram doesn't seem that bad yeah but i uh yeah it was too rich for my blood so i just stayed away from weed the whole time actually that year i smoked weed in mexico a few times uh i smoked weed in bolivia um but it was it was not the greatest yeah cannabis in my experience the coca leaves though were that'd were be fun wonderful. Yeah. yeah 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 i definitely have fun. never never been an upper person but uh chewing a bag of coca leaves really helped me deal with the altitude change. i bet it was I bet. but yeah i'm trying to think of other places that there would be because wrestlers a lot of wrestlers smoke weed so when you're yeah. around the wrestlers there's always cannabis kind of around um but yeah it was it was uh it was an intense year but an amazing year there's like so much shit there's just obviously like you're getting to see some of these places realizing like and i think cannabis and wrestling are the same in this way they cross social lines in the way that punk never really does yeah you know like you'll see cannabis and wrestling in places that have no punk scene or or yeah. maybe a very tiny punk scene and yeah there was uh it was really cool to kind of like think about this the wrestling show basically it was this sort of idea that wrestling everywhere it goes it's going to be like a type of music and it's going to adapt to the local culture and that's why lucha libre and japanese strong style have very little physically in common with each other in their their performance of professional wrestling or the way the execution of professional wrestling but at the same time it's a language that you could stick these two guys in the ring together or two people in the ring together and they'd still yeah. be able to figure out how to have a match with each other and getting to see that bore out like the people in bolivia or the people in kinshasa and the people in Nunavik, and everyone kind of spoke the same language of, of pro wrestling that's so wild yeah because i'm a i'm a big mark for like um new japan pro wrestling like all that stuff like but mostly because of how it intertwined with mma in japan yeah, yeah. and and you'd find these people doing these uh you know choreographed acts and then you know a year later they're in real fights real submission fights Mm -hmm. and just as tough as anyone else you know yeah like the uh uwfi and and pancreas and sort of that and um big japan and and uh and all japan and and new japan as well like the the way the like i think it's terry funk described it in in a podcast i think he did with cole cabana where like wrestling you know if you look at the history of professional wrestling in japan it's there prior to the second world war Mm -hmm. they think it was brought over by masons and it was sort of like just part of like gambling culture like the idea of like fixing wrestling matches yeah the performance of wrestling but it's not until after the second world war and, and ricky dozan this former sumo wrestler 
who, uh, according to what I've read, couldn't uh, arise past a certain rank in sumo because he was part Korean or had uh, a Korean mother, I believe. So kind of hit a ceiling in sumo, came over to wrestling and, and Japan sort of freshly removed from the Second World War. He realized what people wanted to see in Japan was Japanese people fighting Americans. Guys. Yeah. And so they started bringing in these American guys. And because they're one generation removed from armed conflict, a lot of times these guys would get in the ring and they just tried and kill each other. And Terry, Terry, right. Funk, yeah. Terry Funk's like, in America, you're trying to make a work look like a shoot. In Japan, you're trying to make a shoot look like a work because we'd go out there and we'd try and <laughs> fucking kill each other. That's that's wild. But it's 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 funny how that became the style, right? To this day, yeah. that's what strong style is, and that's why Japanese wrestling. So that's what I love too, is because like these guys are going in there and they're or people are going in there um, and just beating the shit out of each other, and and it's very physical and it's very snug and yeah. and very like, and then yeah, at a certain point. I guess people were just like, well, yeah, what if we fought for real? Like, <laughs> right. Like, what yeah. really happened? Like, we really just like didn't bother, you know, deciding who was going to win in advance. And yeah, what that brings. Uh, is, and if you look at like a lot of the early, I guess even UFC guys, a lot of them had experience or training in Japanese pro wrestling. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, so, and that's probably why a lot of them were able to kind of, you know, sh- become the stars they were is because they knew what people wanted to see in the ring and they knew what they the fans needed from their physical combat and yeah and they also had the charisma you know what i mean that's like mm-hmm. a big part of selling yourself in, in any fight yeah yeah and it was uh yeah it was interesting and kind of like going around and realizing that there's like sort of this universal quality to people that wind up being pro wrestlers like not every not to say that everyone's the exact same mm-hmm. but there's and then there's a universal quality of the people that wind up being wrestling fans. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. And they're not necessarily the same types of people. Yeah. And it was it was interesting because it's closer to cannabis in this way that it, it is a secret thing. And mm-hmm. for different reasons, I guess maybe way back when when it was still being fixed in terms of gambling yeah. stuff, it was for kind of the same reasons. You got to keep it secret. But you really don't like the fans in wrestling. It's not like punk where it's like, Hey, you kid come up here. Anybody can do this shit. Yeah. It's like, Hey, you kid come in the ring. I fucking dare you. I'm going to break your arm. Yeah, right. Show you this yeah. is real. Yeah. <laughs> like but one thing I learned very quickly is never read, let a wrestler demonstrate uh, a move on you or demonstrate something on you. And I knew this going in, but the first thing I made, prior to the wrestlers because vice kept being like no you can't make anything about wrestling no one cares about wrestling and then i did this documentary about deathmatch wrestling with this director shawnee who was an amazing director and we went down to the tournament of death in delaware do you know about this thing uh-uh. no so the turn- tournament of death is this annual i believe they're still doing it wrestling event put on by czw on the owner oh the czw one okay yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. on the owner dj hyde's parents yeah his uh, parents yeah that's what it was. yeah yeah the farm and we went out there and we filmed and it was it was nuts and i kept selling it to vice we've been i've been trying to make this documentary with them for years on this thing i'm like you will not believe how crazy this is yeah and i brought it back and they just could not believe how out of control all the violence in this thing was and and that was the first thing that sold them because it did so well on youtube and 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 finally kind of like made them realize that people actually care about wrestling but that i still have nightmares (laughs) that was definitely the wildest shoot ever and the most insane people to deal with yeah yeah i I remember seeing that episode or that (laughs) that whole thing it was nuts Yeah. yeah it was uh we did that one, and then we did another one for the series on on deathmatch wrestling, and and it's a kind of a separate culture than even any other pro wrestling. And now it's kind of merged because AEW puts deathmatch wrestling on TV, yeah. but it was so maligned. And when you talk to even today, when I talk to some of the guys that are you know WWE wrestlers, yeah, they'll be like, "Oh, I hate that shit." And it's kind I of bet. a it's got yeah. like tattoos and scratchers, you know, like yeah, totally professional. Yeah. 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 Or or like um 
or like I, I, I was telling my friend, I'm like, yeah, you got to look at what you're doing. You, you're like Iron Maiden, and that what they're doing is is psycho sin or yeah. or like Napalm Death, maybe even where it's it's not the same. It's but it's it's valid, and there's people that that like it, and yeah, it is definitely extreme, and it's it's weird to watch because you know this person is going to suffer for this afterwards like yeah, permanently permanently like every single cases, person yeah. yeah every single person needs medical attention after wrestling and the the compensation for the level of suffering is completely out of whack yeah it makes no sense <laughs> <laughs> just yeah that was uh it was fascinating for me i'm still fascinated by what motivates that like i've got a lot of friends that that are those kinds of wrestlers or, or do that kind of wrestling and uh yeah it, it is such a uh a weird subsect of a of already strange culture yeah uh, how much do you think that came in to inspire what you did and fucked up oh the blading and stuff yeah yeah oh, I, yeah because yeah, we, we were, when we first started playing shows i would like hit myself with the microphone and try yeah. and bust myself open the hard way like wesley willis does yeah, it did. and right. sound guys fucking hated you. I bet hated me. Yeah, I bled very little, had <laughs> massive bruising and <laughs> severe headaches afterwards. And I was working at a video store at the time, and there was this guy, Glenn Salter, legendary Toronto zine maker, and mm -hmm. played guitar in a bunch of cool bands too. And he had this crazy VHS tape collection about everything, but a lot of wrestling stuff. And I'm like how do they bleed like that? Like, what are they doing to get that? He's like, ah, oh, they, uh, they take aspirin and, and, uh, cut themselves with a razor blade. I'm like, what? You're like, that's like yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, <laughs> it's pretty, now it's all so, so quaint. Like you just type in, how do they bleed on the yeah. wrestling? But at that point it was like, what? He's like, yeah, yeah. They take a little blade. And he's like pointing one. He's like, See that right there. And I'm like, oh shit. So, I can't remember the first time I did it, but it bled like a motherfucker. And it bleeds like anytime you see anything of me and I'm just covered in blood, like yeah, there's that MTV Canada performance where just sheets of blood are coming off my yeah. head. That's always the blade. The blade is yeah, like the it. only way. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think I also kind of tried. It's weird because they're almost hardcore specifically is almost antithetical to like wrestling because wrestling is a presentation of a character and sort yeah. of the manipulation of reality manipulation of reality whereas i think hardcore is about trying to obviously manipulate reality and and you're you're definitely not presenting fact but you're trying to be as real as yeah. possible and as authentically yourself as possible and you're singing about your own life and you're trying to present yourself as a real person on stage, lest you be the misfits or yeah, okay, yeah, or something right. like that, right? Like, and that's that's kind of like what you're trying to do. So I think during the songs, wrestling definitely influences it, but in between, it's like almost the resistance to be a guy up there cutting promos. Yeah, it's like I okay, Drip I down. Want, yeah, I don't want to be doing that. I want it to be as like real as possible in between the songs, so it's not like some danzig s character that i'm playing yeah. out there you want more Let me <laughs> hear you. that would have been excellent though to see that version of you i'm sure i have it in me give me you know <laughs> enough time on the road want to sit at the table with the syndicate check out our patreon in our link tree or description below our merch site is officially live we have all sorts of shirts hoodies and goodies to sort you out and shipping is super fast and most importantly, the quality is top notch. I've been saving old designs for years for this purpose, so please check it out, syndicategear.com. We also have an underground syndicate discord where we get together and solve old strain history together daily. It's an amazing community of learning away from IG and it's an amazing resource for old catalogs and knowledge. We hope you join our union of readers and growers. Come check it out.